We've just learned a little bit about failure analysis, but what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to conduct one in a more systematic way. And so we're going to talk about now risk and failure analysis. More recently, in the last few years, risk has been taking on a broader and broader definition. In the new ISO 31000, risk has been defined as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And we see risk occurring in a variety of sources. In an organization, it can be from financial markets, it can be from threat or project failures, it could be legal liabilities, it could be credit risk, accident risk, natural causes and disasters, or you know, uh, acts of war. Anything can come in, even moves of competitors. And all of, many of these events have an uncertainty or an unpredictable causal system. So when we want to take a look at this, we have to understand what is the function of risk that we can actually manage in our process. <clears throat> so risk management is a process to identify, assess, and prioritize risks, and it's followed by some sort of coordinated approach to manage, mitigate, and reduce those risks so we don't see the negative impact in terms of the outcomes of what we're producing in the organization. So risk is part of both quality by design as well as a corrective action process, and we have to do it to be successful. So using this broader definition of risk, we see that we can actually identify a five-step process for understanding what's going on. The first is situational awareness, making sense out of the potential risks that the organization is facing. Second phase, we go into observation identification. We have to perceive the risk and classify it and understand what is it doing? How do we deal with it? And then the third phase, we go through assessment and, and evaluation where we're analyzing the alternatives we have, what are the options we should take. The fourth step, we're going to screen and prioritize. So we're going to order the risk response by criticality and how fast we need to act in terms of sense of urgency. And then after that, we go into treatment and management. So treatment is where we take action. We do something about the risk that's facing us. And we then work to achieve control so that that risk does not have the impact that was originally projected. So each of these five phases is meant to identify systems that are, or, or issues that are creating problems in the organization. And there's, we need to distinguish a little bit between sort of three different types of things happening. And we can call these the three Fs, and that stands for flaw, fault, and failure. So a flaw is an error or mistake that's been designed in the way a process performs or a product acts. Many times it's inadvertent. So we might have a flaw in a sweater. We don't see it, but if we pull on it or it jigs, we see then the sweater sort of falling apart. So this type of error may be unknown until it's actually specifically found because it becomes a fault. So a flaw, when it becomes a fault, is something that is, is now activated by some mechanism, but it may not yet be a failure. Why? Maybe we don't see it. Maybe it is not detected. And so this type of error is unknown until such time as the function is activated into an observable failure event. And at the time it's observable, then it becomes a failure. Well, here's the problem. What's happening with products that we have in the field? We have field reports happening, and they are failures. They've been detected by customers, they're reported, and maybe they return the product. But that doesn't tell us all about the faults that actually may still be in the field but have not been detected. The type of error, it's unknown because it may not have been activated in a particular product. It may be only a certain set of circumstances that will actually drive the fault into a recognizable failure. In addition, we also don't know about those flaws that have never been, if you will, specifically developed into a fault, but it's just sitting there. For instance, in software, we may have a code that has never been activated before. It's got an error in it. But because it's never been activated, there's no need to understand that there's a fault there. But once we have it activated, we see immediately the flaw becomes a fault, becomes a failure. So failures on software and hardware can act in very different ways. Hardware will tend to be more discriminant. Software, though, it's much more difficult because we can never test all of the logical paths in most modern software. As a result of that, we have many software systems that may indeed have hidden flaws in them, 
that have never been recognized in terms of the fault, many times because those pathways have never even been tested or used. So <clears throat> when we want to build a system for risk management, we have to start with this idea of situational awareness. What are the potential risks in terms of the use of that system that we'd like to have by the users of the system? Which of those risks are important? How do we evaluate them? What are the scenarios in which this product is going to be used? What are the limits of application of the product? What's the vulnerability of the process of use in terms of specific threats of failure from different categories? What would be the intent, unintended consequences of a projected type of failure? And what's the degree of ambiguity in the external environmental situation that we have to deal with in terms of how is this actually going to be used in this intended environment? And from this, we have to clarify the issues and concerns that we have for achieving the desired performance outcome. Observation and identification, we have to perceive and classify risk. So here we have to understand the situation, how we define the framework for action. We have to witness the process actively at the source of the risk, determine what events could trigger the problems or the create benefits from a risk, if it's an opportunity increasing risk. We have to evaluate the scenarios internally as well as externally. How is the competition doing with this risk? And finally, all those threats of failures can be identified and characterized. What are the real risks we have? Is it losing money? Is it human errors? Is it a safety hazard, an accident, abuse of information? What are the potential mechanisms that we're worried about? Assessment and evaluation says the information that we have has to have integrity. And noise in the data or noise in the field, if it overwhelms the signal, then it means that what has happened is we've lost all the information about the risk. So information is a combination of the location of the performance, the trend in the performance, as well as the consistency in the performance. Statistical control is when we understand all of that process behavior and there are no unanticipated consequences or occurrence of unpredicted uh, situations. Well, that's very difficult to get to if we haven't engineered the product with taking that into account from the very beginning. Without statistical control, there can be no reliable prediction and risk will exist in the behavior of any process. Finally, the, uh, screening and prioritization. Now we're getting into the classification of the risks. What is the probability? What is the potential impact of those risks? And then how do we assess this in terms of triggering of events? And finally, how do we treat and mitigate those risks? Can we do things that transfer risk to something else? Insurance, for instance. Do we avoid risk completely by closing down a high business? Do we take action by avoiding the risk or eliminating the risk, withdraw from a risky adventure, reducing, sharing the risk, retaining? So we want to mitigate the risk. We'd like to make sure that the risk does not actually influence us in any negative way. Now. How do we approach this in terms of a scientific approach to analyzing risk? Well, historically, the risk rating methods have used very subjective, arbitrary rating mechanisms. And these distort the real nature of risk through the way that the scales for probability and severity have been assessed. Some of these mechanisms also don't really properly concentrate on the physics of failure or the chemistry of failure or even the human factors of failure. When analyzing risk at the green belt level of analysis, it's sufficient to conduct typically what we call a potential problem analysis. So the potential problem analysis, we see it's a, a, a spreadsheet here, and it can be put in, into Excel. And what we see, it's a systematic process for uncovering and dealing with potential risks that are reasonably likely to occur and worthy of attention. This is not what you do for the design of a process, but this is what you can do for understanding how a process is working in operation. And so what do we see? In the first column, we see plans or activities. So these are where the risk is coming from. Is it from a project? Is it from a, a particular action? Is it from a step in a process? So this describes what, when, where, and the extent of a particular risk item that we want to address. The potential problem says what's most likely to go wrong for that particular area of risk? What are the possible deviations from intended target? So it's not an in-depth analysis, but just a highlight. So one particular plan, process, or activity may have several potential problems. And just as you see that, each potential problem may have one or more effects. 
So the effect is what the customer or the end user would see as a symptom. It's the consequences of the failure on that process in the operation. And it answers the question, what does the customer experience as a result of this particular issue or this particular failure? Now, for each of the effects, we would say, what is the likely cause? So these are the factors that can cause or uh, this anticipated problem. And so we can use cause-effect diagrams like the Ishikawa diagram or so forth to start understanding some of the causal systems. Maybe we want to use our analytics in terms of the structure of the product, such as a reliability block diagram or a breakdown diagram of the functions in a process. So these are all the things that we would want to check to understand how well they actually are contributing or how strongly they're contributing to the problem that is created by the effect. We then have rankings that we put for severity and likelihood or probability of occurrence. And we're going to use then a 10-point rating scale, which is also used in failure mode effects analysis. And I'll recommend a rating scale to you in just a moment. When we talk about preventive actions, these work on the causes. These keep the causes from happening. And they identify how do we keep those things from actually becoming a reality. So prevention can address one or more potential causes. Contingent actions are operating on the effects. Once we see this happening, what can we do to reduce the impact on the potential customer? And then finally, the last item here is the trigger for a contingent action. What is that loop that says, if this happens, then we should have an automatic detection and then trigger the contingent action to actually be activated? So what is the condition that says, when this occurs, this particular risk has gone from a probability to a reality? And then what countermeasures can we actually affect to make sure that we don't realize that problem? Well, two more components that I want to add to the potential problem analysis. One is a severity rating. So this is the impact on the customer. And typically, we will see these measured on a 10-point scale. Now, what I would recommend is that you use a scale that's similar to this, where we have anchored points. Extreme, for instance, is a 10. But high could be 9 or 8. Moderate could be seven or six, low five or four. And at each one of those ranking points, we have the label and then we have a descriptive in terms of what the impact on the customer is. That description on the impact of the customer should be modified so that it's appropriate for your product or service that you're considering. So not everything is gonna be a dangerous effect to user or the environment. Sometimes it could be death. Sometimes it could be a paper cut. So we have to make sure that we get the scaling right and the actual risk based on what it is that the process is seeing. So severity is this impact. The ones that are labeled as seven and above are like a showstopper event. If I was designing the system and I rank something with that level of risk, we wouldn't be launching the product. We would be fixing it well before we launch it. And until those conditions are fixed, we wouldn't consider introducing it to the market. The other thing we see is, is that we can have different types of failure. So we could have business of severity cost. So cost risk, cost overruns. We can have technical failure risk dealing with the quality of the product. We can have program failure risk dealing with the schedule. So depending on where we are and what type of thing we're dealing with, if we're dealing with a project, we might have a variety of different types of risks that we would consider in terms of impact for the future. The other factor that we, we have a ranking scale for is probability of failure. And this is how often do we have the failures happening? So extreme is something like greater than 10% fuel failure rate. Very high is maybe 5 to 10% and so forth. And high is over 2.5%. And then we see that there's another scale here, and we see field failure rate in parts per million and switching then to process capability. So we see CPK less than 1 is an 8. CPK 1 to 1.25 is a 7. Moderate is between 1.25 and 1.5. And we can also take a look at service level agreements there in terms of service processes. And we see that mandatory processes basically are saying we have to fix these things because the business is actually in a state of failure such that customers will be able to detect, notice, and they will judge you based on that negative performance. So, potential problem analysis. Why do we do this? When we do a process map, we focus on the way the process actually operates. We don't always think about things gone wrong. 
When you do the potential problem analysis, you're thinking about what can go wrong in the process. And you know, by the time you're thinking about that, you also realize, you know, we do some other steps in the process map. So when you're doing these two, try to do them in the same time frame so that you actually get both the negative view from the failure analysis and a positive view of the process from the process mapping. And that way you'll have a much more comprehensive understanding of the way things work, how they can fail, and what you can do about them.